Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lauren Sarkeesian, and I'm a senior policy counsel here at OTI, focusing on government surveillance and privacy issues, as well as AI. For the past few years, OTI, led by my colleague Sandy Singh, has been looking into how internet de platforms develop and deploy AI systems and machine learning based tools to, cur to curate the content we see online. OTI has also done work related to government uses of artificial intelligence, including the facial recognition and, and, and procurement contexts. We're very excited to have released a new report last week, which explores and compares the different mechanisms that internet platforms and governments can use to, prov to promote fairness, accountability, and transparency around high-risk AI systems. So we tend to talk about many of these accountability mechanisms in a silo. Today's panel will focus on exploring some of these approaches and if and how they can work together to generate greater accountability around high-risk AI systems. We'll have some time at the end of the panel for questions. So uh, audience members, please um, submit questions via Slido. So now I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists. First, Professor Catherine Sharkey, who is the Siegel Family Professor of Regulatory Law and Policy at NYU School of Law. Professor Sharkey is one of the nation's leading authorities on the economic loss rule, punitive damages, and federal preemption. Last year, she co-authored the Government by Algorithm Report on how federal administrative agencies are and should be using artificial intelligence for the Administrative Conference of the United States, or ACUS uh, for short. Uh, next, we have Dr. Christine Custis, who is the head of About ML, um, which is a program at the Partnership on AI. Her work focuses on bringing together a diverse range of perspectives to develop, test, and implement machine learning system documentation practices at scale. Christine also leads fairness, transparency, and accountability work at PAI. Finally, we have Spandy Singh, who is a policy analyst at OTI. Spandy's work focuses on content moderation, disinformation, algorithmic accountability, government surveillance, and privacy. In OTI's recent report, we covered a, brain, a broad range of mechanisms that can be used to promote fairness, accountability, and transparency around high-risk algorithmic systems. This includes machine learning documentation frameworks, transparency reports, government procurement uh, processes, audits, impact assessments, and more. I wanna start off by honing in on some of these approaches and exploring what advantages they may have to, to offer, as well as what uh, limitations they may have when we think about promoting fairness, accountability, and transparency around AI. So Christine, we're gonna start with you. Um, About ML is a multi-stakeholder initiative that is trying to push for the implementation of machine learning documentation practices at scale. Could you explain a bit about what the About ML program uh, aims to do and why you think this approach um, could be useful when we're talking about promoting transparency and high-risk high AI systems? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the question. So About ML, it's actually an acronym and I'm gonna read it because it's so long and I wanna get it right. It's annotation and benchmarking on understanding and transparency of machine learning life cycles. And in short, this is just work that we believe is imperative because it is how we think we can operationalize transparency at scale through documentation. It's the way we believe we can action responsible AI through the documentation of the different phases of the machine learning life cycle. And so what we hope to do is set a new industry norm of documenting all ML systems uh, as they're being built, as they're being deployed, changing this entire practice at scale. And a lot of times when you hear about the software development life cycle, you know, there is documentation inherent in the life cycle that's uh, well received, well known. Somehow in the machine learning life cycle, it's not so much. Uh, so we're trying to bring that uh, to, that to bear in that life cycle through research-based multi-pronged initiatives, soliciting feedback from stakeholders and baking ethics right into the process. Thank you. 
Thanks for that explanation. Um, Catherine, uh, the government by algorithm report had some really interesting insights uh, around government procurement of AI tools, um, noting that just under half of the algorithms uh, government agencies use right now are procured externally. Uh, can you talk about the instances in which government procurement of external algorithmic systems could be beneficial uh, to promoting fairness, accountability, and transparency in these systems? And also discuss some of the concerns that they raise uh, or, or that sort of arise by relying on just procurement processes. Sure, um, and thank you. Thanks uh, to Spandy for the invitation to join this panel. Um, so by way of uh, very brief background, I was part of um, a very large collaborative study um, that engaged uh, NYU and Stanford law students and computer scientists, we brought together the lawyers and the technologists. Um, I had colleagues at Stanford on the project. It was commissioned by ACUS, the Administrative Conference of the United States. That's an independent agency that tries to be a kind of fertile ground for the production of useful empirical information that agencies might be able to look to. So um, in a nutshell, we were struck by the fact that there were numerous commentators and scholars that were very engaged in the question of how AI should be regulated, particularly less attention actually on governmental use, much attention on how government might try to regulate in the private sector, and yet very little information about actual, whether fledgling or more well-developed uses within government. So our, we tried several different takes in this report. We did a canvas at the largest um, measured by number of employees, federal agencies, 142. We researched and canvassed. And of those, one of the interesting findings was nearly half um, had what we would uh, call existing uses of machine learning slash artificial um, intelligence. So um, sort of popular opinion sometimes think that nothing's happening within government or government's way behind the private sector. So that was one finding. And then Lauren, as you alluded to, we um, tried to look, um, not only are they using these tools, we tried to have them classified by level of sophistication and also by whether they were um, coming primarily in-house or through outside procurement. And our findings were actually that 53% were coming from in-house. So we can come back to that, but that's interesting in and of itself, because again, the procurement is an important piece and angle, but I think often missed is kind of what's happening with respect to internal capacity development within federal agencies themselves, maybe thinking about why this is happening, maybe thinking about some of the things that Christine alluded to in terms of getting um, some kind of accountability frameworks kind of ensconced within federal agencies. But there were 33% um, were being contracted for private from the private sector. So you're right, uh, there's another 14% that makes up that external that are non-commercial collaborations. And that's important too, because government is collaborating with nonprofits and with academic entities. But this roughly one third are being contracted from the private sector. And so again, you raise a very um, broad question. I'll try to be somewhat succinct. There are advantages and disadvantages. Maybe I'll start with some of the disadvantages. Sometimes we have to be careful about thinking about off the shelf private sector tools being imported in terms of um, governmental use, right? Um, what I would uh, focus on is the need to get the lawyer policy and technologists in the room together while developing these tools. Oftentimes within government, there are very nuanced, complex tasks that are very policy dependent and it's um, a little too late kind of ex post to ask, do these tools meet our objectives for accountability and the like? Um, so that's one, um, one piece uh, that I would emphasize that sometimes um, there are going to be costs with respect to ensuring accountability and ensuring that these tools sufficiently meet all the nuanced policy goals within the agency. There can be costs of monitoring such tools and the like as well. On the plus side, a kind of advantage, and this was one of um, the features that I particularly like, there's much um, to commend this cracking open the black dots report. But one thing that I liked was a kind of theme or an emphasis on how government potentially could use this procurement process to force uh, 
some accountability. And so I do think that there are very interesting ways that um, through the government procurement process, the government can demand certain types of accountability standards. I also think there's a lot of discussion about how it will never be possible because of all sorts of barriers in the private sector with respect to trade secrets and patents and protections. And my response to that would be, well, with respect to dealing with the government, maybe as a lever, the government's gonna be able to demand a certain type of access to be able to ensure the kind of accountability that we need for these um, types of tools. So I do think it's very worthwhile to think about the ways in which um, this process can be a kind of carrot, maybe sometimes stick, but a carrot for enforcing some of these accountability mechanisms. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and, and for going back a little and providing the background about the report, which was really just so crucial and, and provided the most insight by far um, to, into how the government is using AI. Um, so anyway, yes, I jumped ahead a little bit with that question, but appreciate the background. Um, Spandy, next over to you. In OTI's recent report, um, you wrote about how mechanisms such as algorithmic audits, risk assessments, and impact assessments can be used to rein in high-risk algorithmic systems. Can you talk about what value you think these kinds of assessments have in promoting uh, FAT, for short, we'll say, um, around high-risk AI systems, and if you see any limitations? Thanks, Lauren, and thanks to all of our panelists for joining us today. Um, so I think if conducted properly and transparently, audits, impact assessments, and other methods of evaluations can be valuable mechanisms for promoting FAT around high-risk AI, both in the corporate and government sector. Um, some of the benefits of these approaches include uh, they can shed light on the opaque nature of high-risk AI systems. They can help evaluate specific variables that we are often concerned about, like privacy, bias, fairness, and human rights. Um, they can examine unintended harms of a system and help an entity create a roadmap for mitigating these issues. Um, they can enable investigation of certain concerns that are raised by external stakeholders, um, such as impacted communities or civil rights organizations. Uh, and they can also help an entity determine whether their system is in line with their own internal policies or, um, and or external standards or regulations. Um, but I think in order for these assessments to deliver these benefits, we need multi-stakeholder consensus on definitions, we need standards for these evaluations and so on. So I think it's been really interesting and great to see over the last few years how stakeholders from civil society government and platforms have been debating and encouraging the use of these methods. But I think the key limitation I see in the space is that we haven't answered the fundamental who, what, when, where, why, and how question, which is really important if these evaluations are going to be effectively deployed. So in terms of who, you know, who is conducting these evaluations for maximum accountability? Is it a third party entity? Is it the companies or government agencies a combination of both. Uh, there's a lot of really great literature, we talk about this in the report as well, that if an entity is grading their own homework, it's really generating the kind of accountability that we need. Um, the second one, um, what, what are we evaluating? Are we talking about auditing for privacy or doing an impact assessment on risks to free expression or bias? Um, you know, not all high-risk AI systems have the same objectives or designs. So we might even need multiple different frameworks um, depending on the context in which a system is being deployed. Uh, the when uh, question is when during the AI life cycle should these evaluations take place? Um, as we talk about in the report, many stakeholders have suggested that uh, algorithmic impact assessments should occur before a system is deployed to identify potential harms. Um, others have suggested that audits should be taking place pre and post, uh, sorry, post deployment, and they should continuously be taking place to ensure that systems are still functioning as intended. Uh, the where question is where are the results of the audits communicated and where is the oversight coming from? Um, and then the why is what goal are you trying to achieve with these assessments? Um, so I think we need clear answers to these questions in order for these assessment methods to be valuable in promoting FAT. 
Uh, right now, the use of these evaluations are all voluntary. So, you know, vague and unclear guidance is generally a disincentive for an entity to participate in them. Um, and I think a lack of standards and clarity also undermines credibility. There have been a number of really interesting audits, for example, that have been conducted by journalists and researchers, but since there is no consensus around the methodology and the correct approach, the applicability of these findings is generally limited. Thank you. Um, and switching gears a little bit, since there are so many different sort of um, accountability mechanisms to cover here, um, Christine, we're going to turn back to you and um, talk about sort of documentation frameworks. So there's there's numerous different existing frameworks for data and systems documentation uh, in the machine learning context. These can, these include Microsoft's uh, data sheets for for data sets framework, IBM's uh, fact sheets framework, and the model cards framework that Google initially championed. Um, these approaches share some similarities and differences, um, but can you talk about if and how these frameworks could be applied to a high risk AI system and sort of how impactful they can be? Yes, absolutely. So I'll just do a little bit of pitch here and I just wanna encourage all of the folks that are participating today to take a look at the Partnership on AI's website. It's partnershiponai.org. We have a reference document, we have a resource library and lots of great tools out there. And we'd love to hear from you if you ever use them and your experience. But I will say that throughout this machine learning life cycle, there are so many opportunities for record keeping, for documentation throughout data specification and curation, uh, data integration, one source with another, the maintenance of that data, keeping it fresh, uh, throughout the model specification and training and evaluation and integration and maintenance is all these opportunities to keep track of what is happening, who did it, what the outcomes are, the impacts are to the system, to the users, to the impacted non-users, right? And so there's opportunity throughout the life cycle to do this type of record keeping and documentation, which is beneficial to a high risk AI system, because you know, if we don't get it right, we at least wanna be able to go back and trace the error. We wanna be able to figure out the source of the harm. So giving ourselves this opportunity throughout the life cycle, keeping track of uh, just all sorts of administrivia, minutia, so that we can go back and check that. And I will say, you know, you mentioned all the different types of tools and methodologies that are out there. Right now, we're doing a meta-analysis of tools, and we've found 400 so far. There are so many different ways to document an ML system, you know, and then ways that we may not even discover. Uh, so the way you choose is not necessarily as important as your consistency, uh, that cultural shift into record keeping and being transparent through your documentation. And then I'll also say that um, every way is not right for every organization. For instance, a small startup dealing in patient care in the UK may not wanna use model cards. It's very bulky. You won't have one card, you'll have multiple. It's bulky, you have GDPR to, to consider. You have privacy and security of uh, personally identifiable uh, information for patients. So it's a really great opportunity to sort of get out there and see what's available, uh, figure out the specific use case for the, for the problem you're trying to solve, and just find ways to sort of cafeteria style mix and match throughout the entire life cycle of your machine learning system, different ways, different approaches to documentation. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, thanks for that. Uh, Spandy, back over to you. A number of legislative proposals in both the EU and the US uh, have included provisions that would require internet platforms and government agencies to conduct audits or assessments of their algorithmic systems. What are the key elements that 
such legislation needs uh, in order to appropriately address the risks and harms associated with high-risk AI systems. Thanks, Lauren. So as you mentioned, we've seen legislators everywhere from the EU to the US to Canada and beyond put forth proposals that include audits and fact assessments and so on. So it's good to see that policymakers are thinking through these important issues, but I think a lot of these proposals generally lack teeth for three reasons. Um, first, uh, there's a lack of clear and consensus-based definitions on terms like automated decision systems, high-risk AI, amplification, and so on. And I think, you know, in a civil society context, perhaps we may have a general understanding of what these terms mean, but when you're trying to implement it into the law, it needs to be a little more granular. Um, and this lack of clarity makes it practically confusing and difficult for companies or agencies to implement these evaluations. Um, it also makes it difficult for external stakeholders to research and understand the scope of these methods. Um, the second reason is a lot of these um, proposals lack clear guidance on how these evaluations should be structured and implemented. Um, some policymakers have proposed drawing on existing guidance around assessments from sectors like the financial sector, where auditing is a very common practice. Um, auditing for discrimination as how in housing is also common. Um, and sectors like the environmental and aerospace um, industries also have um, pretty robust evaluation practices. I think this is a good first step, but I think in order for us to really talk about the auditing of high-risk AI or assessments of high-risk AI, we need to contextualize any sort of best practices we get from other industries and really get more granular. Um, and then the third reason is that these proposals don't really address the intermediate needs, such as the need for funding to establish an external third-party auditing or assessment landscape uh, that is uh, you know, well-resourced and legitimate. Um, and without this, I think you know, we can see a lot of different um, options play out, but I think one of the most concerning is that well, we could see communities who are most affected by high-risk AI systems have to take on this external review function and uh, they may not have the necessary resources to do this, and they also won't be compensated for this work. And I think in that way, it, this can kind of further exacerbate uh, existing inequities uh, in, that these technologies can create. Um, in terms of what good legislation should have, uh, one I think is really critical is uh, good legislation should propose clear guidance around transparency, around results. So at the very minimum, I think, subject to evaluation should be required to publish a summary of their findings and how they've addressed the issues so that they can generate some accountability. Um, in cases where audits are being conducted externally or assessments are be being conducted externally, uh, the evaluators may need access to sensitive data. And I think uh, legislation can help establish these data sharing structures. Uh, right now, there are many conversations happening about, for example, researchers accessing internet platform data and I think that these, um, these sort of conversations around how uh, structures can be set up to assuage platform concerns around trade secrets and privacy can inform this broader AI uh, evaluation conversation. Um, and then lastly, I think legislation also needs to address the broader ecosystem that enables high-risk AI systems to uh, be so potentially harmful. So for example, in the US, we need comprehensive privacy legislation to rein in data collection practices. A lot of this data goes to training new models, and I think we, we really need to institute clear and strong uh, limits and to encourage platforms to promote user controls as well, so that we're not just focusing narrowly, but also on the larger ecosystem of things that could impact that data. Thanks, Bandy. Um... Okay, Catherine, over to you next. Um, and we've all been talking a lot in, in various contexts about transparency. Um, in the ACUS report, you talked about how transparency mechanisms need uh, to generate actionable and interpretable transparency in order to promote accountability. Uh, the report also mentions that administrative law works in tandem with an array of data and disclosure laws that in their current form can sharply limit transparency. Uh, do you think that these kinds of laws need to be reformed? And if so, how? Great. So um, I want to go back, uh, if you don't mind, just for a minute to contextualize again the question and, and go back actually, Spandy, to some your 
your um, second to last uh, remarks about the various tools, the audits, the impact assessments, and you came back to it here with respect to legislative um, uh, proposals, because I'm very struck, um, I'll give a very quick sort of analogy. Um, a prior ACUS field study I did went into federal agencies and looked at federal agencies that had gotten very um, aggressive about preempting or ousting state tort law. So they were coming up with federal standards and as part of that standard, they would oust state tort law. Now it turned out in administrative law that agencies were supposed to be filling out what are called federalism impact statements. So you alluded to like the environmental impact statements and some audits in the financial sector. But I actually think that federalism impact statements has like a very close analogy here because it's a very policy inflected area. We get into disputes over what is is federalism, what would a federalism impact be? How are states affected by what the, federal, what the federal agencies are doing? And I'll never forget the personal footnote I'll say is I went into a very high level uh, rule writing person and policy leader within a federal agency. And I started talking about these federalism impact statements and how could it be that a federal agency, for example, had just written a rule to entirely oust state law and yet said there were no federalism impacts. Right, it was written into the rule, and he turned around the way and showed me binders. And he said, "You know what those binders are? Each one was like this thick." He said, "Those are all of the required impact assessments that we're supposed to do every time we're doing rulemaking. So you want to add a new binder? There's an existing binder for federalism, and it's like this size. And you want to put in all this academic, intellectual content about what standards there should be, who should review it, where's the oversight, etc. And so one might be at first." at least within the governmental context, a little bit um, humbled by how are we going to do this with um, AI? How are we going to have not just federalism accountability, which I've given a lot of thought to, but now let's switch it and say, how are we going to have AI accountability? And I guess the first note that I would say is that notwithstanding how important I think federalism is, and that I argued then and still believe it should have its right place in review of agency regulations, we all, I think, could agree that sort of algorithmic governance is a sea change, right? So this is something really significant, really important. It should challenge us. It should challenge those of us working in the real world, those of us in academia, like myself, who are ensconced in thinking about administrative law and accountability frameworks. This isn't just some like side area. This is a sea change. I believe federal agencies, let's just take the FDA, which regulates medical devices and drugs, they are having a sea change, right? With respect to how they have to regulate the use of AI within medical devices and drugs, what's happening internally, how their rulemaking will be affected, looking way down the future, what will happen when we have virtual clinical trials instead of actual ones. When we think about federal agencies, they are increasingly becoming data aggregators themselves. So Spondi's exactly right that we have to think about sort of a lot of our typical frameworks, which I think can be imported into this space, we have to think about it in a kind of transformative way. So having said that, right, I would go back to some basics. I do think that there are some administrative law frameworks. So again, to take the work that I've done in federalism accountability, there are frameworks that we can set up that force agencies, for example, to conduct these um, impacts assessments with respect to AI, and then doesn't just leave it there. There are mechanisms of control, right? If we think about the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OIRA, which does centralized review of agency rules and regulations, they typically focus on significant ones, sometimes defined as financially significant, but there are ways that we could refashion, right, the use of machine learning algorithmic tools within rulemaking to constitute significance because, and here's the good part, right, the good part of the story is these administrative law frameworks that already exist focus on things like accountability, transparency, reasons giving. Now, what they mean in this context, Fandy, you're exactly right. There's all sorts of um, lack of consensus, need for further thinking. But let's again go back to just simple basic administrative law. Like let's assume an agency starts deploying these tools within rulemaking. They have to set things forward in a notice and comment rulemaking. They have to put out to the public these things like the assessments. They have to receive input from all of these entities, both you know, 
uh, stakeholders, random law professors, whomever is interested in these, to debate these kinds of concepts. And I think that's really, really important. And I think that before, in, in a way, before we get to what other, this question, I'm not trying to necessarily dodge it, but before we get to the question of what other types of laws have to be um, refined, we should first think about how this existing administrative law framework, which by the way, not only could force agencies to conduct this internally and have some kind of executive review through OIRA, but we have judicial review too. And so the whole notion of judges, at least in this rulemaking context, sort of getting up to speed, so to speak, and thinking of what's acceptable reasons giving for the deployment of these tools will go a long way. And I, I believe that it will become, sometimes I feel like we get stymied by thinking about how the barriers are insuperable. So just to come back again to something very concrete and something I know quite well within the FDA, you know, the FDA is not only sort of the most powerful ex ante federal regulator in the entire world, but it has the most data, right? It doesn't just review um, tertiary analyses of data and the capabilities of now getting more real time ex post data with respect to, say, medical devices that are out in the real world, et cetera, leads us to a point, I think, that talks about how government, at least, already has the capacity to be imposing these kinds of accountability constraints on its own use and deployment of this data, sharing with the public through the notice and comment process, having ex internal executive branch and external judicial review. And I think a lot could be learned through that process. I fear sometimes the idea of a kind of um, wait and see approach. Um, the final thing I'll say is, um, Spandy, you raised, and this question also raises um, really difficult issues about the interplay between ensuring kind of transparency with respect to reasons giving in this administrative law context and things like data privacy and also security. And the only comment I'll say on that is that that is an issue that is going to cut across, you know, the entire federal administrative state. So e right now, each of our agencies have their own mission. They have their own ways that they're starting to think about the deployment of machine learning and AI tools. But this, this like algorithmic accountability, is one that's going to be cross-cutting across the entire federal administrative state. And I think a lot more thought has to be put into place as to how we're going to have kind of coordination among federal agencies. So things like um, this panel are somewhat of a help, things like efforts by ACUS, you know, which is trying to share information between federal agencies, anything um, I believe that kind of puts in the same room both lawyers and technologists to be discussing this issue and also puts in the same room people from government and the private sector and get them working together thinking, at a, at, as Christine was arguing earlier, thinking about the life cycle at the very earliest stages, right? I've been in too many panels where some of the technologists will talk about how they'll go about developing and then down the line, sort of administrative law or the law will say thumbs up, thumbs down. That is not the way this should operate. And, and um, hopefully we can um, collectively change the kind of trajectory of thinking along those lines. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. And sounds like our federal government is going to need a lot of smart people across embedded, um, you know, who, who, who know their stuff. And as you said, are, um, you know, both lawyers and technologists working together uh, as the ACUS report really emphasized. So thank you. Um, so I guess somewhat related, I think a lot of you brought up various points related to um, uh, sort of high risk AI systems. So uh, in all of this, we're talking about may maybe not using sort of the strictest accountability mechanisms to, to regulate every single um, algorithm, but we're, main we're often mainly focused on uh, sort of the highest priority algorithms. So high risk AI is what often uh, the term we're using. So there's this ongoing debate around how to define high risk AI. 
I wanna pose the question to all of our panelists here. How do you think high-risk AI should be defined? And how can we as a community, I guess, between civil society and academics and our um, private sector partners um, work to reach consensus around a definition? Christina, I'll jump in. Like you're going first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll jump in just for a first voice in the space. I want to push back just a little bit on the categorization of risk. Um, we do have with at the Partnership on AI an incident database, um, and it's sort of a repository of harms where we keep track of any harm that AI has caused. It's out in production, it's out in the world, and it has already impacted human beings. Um, and th these are, you know, range from it misspelled your name on an application to an autonomous vehicle had an impact with a human being. So we have a repository of harms that we keep uh, it is not subjective. It's just a curation of news articles and other write-ups that have already uh, been publicly made available. The reason I want to push back just a little bit on which AI is high-risk AI is because of the cascading effect of any machine learning system or AI system and the impact that goes well beyond deployment. Um, we talked a little bit in the beginning about how AI can impact users, the people who log in and actually make use of the system, can impact the engineers or developers who are in community in uh, creating the system. But there's also a very important demographic that we often uh, leave out, which is the impacted non-user. I like to use an ex as an example, if you go to the bank and you apply for a mortgage and you get rejected, probably no one in that bank can tell you what the algorithm was that made that decision. And that's an issue, especially if you don't have insight as a stakeholder, as an impacted non-user of some algorithm or some mechanism or some collection of models you don't have insight into how that information was used and is kept. Uh, so I just, I think it, it, at, some, at some vantage point, it's all high risk, you know, because there's so much happening, uh, not to use the, the term in, in the title of your paper, this black box, we just need more visibility and transparency. So I would say the, the risk, whether it's high or low or medium is not necessarily the way we would categorize the AI, but I'd say it's the way we should categorize our uh, visibility into it. So it's high risk if we can't tell you what the heck is going on. Low risk if we know exactly what's happening, but there's still some outliers, some things that could occur. So that's just what I'll add to the conversation in terms of the way we categorize the risk. Um, but of course, I do believe that documentation is at least part of the solution. Uh, yeah, I'll just jump in. So um, I'm fascinated, um, Christine, by this metaphor too of the cascading effect of AI. Um, uh, so I feel I'm torn here because on the one hand, um, categorizing things as high risk is reminiscent, for example, to come back to the FDA of having like class three medical devices that are given the most scrutiny because they're devices that affect, you know, potentially life versus class one, which are like band-aids. So we need to have some kind of, in the governmental sector, we do need to have kind of different, I think it's appropriate to have a kind of risk management type of strategy. And yet I'm convinced, you know, listening to you, that, um, and this gets back to the heart of the question, uh, that, um, that we might be better served. I mean, you propose one in terms of sort of how opaque or how explainable. In some sense you would have a metric of, is this, where are we? You know, there's new, new an emerging field of explainable AI. So we might have a continuum. And if you are on the 
um, end of more explainable AI, then you put that into lower risk. Another way to do it would be to be really focused. And again, I'm going to come at this from the governmental uses, but we might have very different demands. I think we should have very different demands with respect to the uses. If this is being deployed in a way that could, for example, take away someone's individual benefits or affect someone's, you know, right to a type of service versus, you know, some kind of mechanism for policing a new emergent health and safety risk. I mean, we might, you know, so we might kind of think about high risk with respect to the um, type of use. And we might think differently about in government uses that are in enforcement uses that are in like adjudication of individual benefits, let's say, and then things like the rulemaking process that I was alluding to um, earlier. The final note I'll say that brings me back a little bit, I wouldn't, I hadn't used this cascading uh, metaphor, but I worry in my space about governmental uses that too often scholars uh, will draw a kind of line in the sand and say that if it's just being used for a supportive use, we don't have to worry about the whole administrative law accountability framework I was talking about before. But if it's being used for determinative, like it's making the actual determination decision, then we do. And there's a lot of talk too about a human in the loop. So long as there's a human in the loop, we wouldn't be as worried. I guess I worry, and I've seen, um, and maybe the cascading metaphor is a good one, that there are some uses, initial deployment of these technologies that look like they're very mundane, just supportive, um, not really affecting decision making at ever, at whatsoever. And then as they learn and develop, they start crossing that line. And so I worry about the idea of these, you know, lines in the sand. I worry very much about how there's a human in the loop, but the AI has actually been making a determination and the, the human really has no force to go against that. So I think you've put your finger on something that's very important. I think I would stress that we should think we should define these concepts sort of along a continuum um, so as we don't uh, inadvertently create sort of safe harbors that allow certain types of deployment of these tools to evade uh, scrutiny, the kind of scrutiny that I talked about earlier. Okay, and I can just jump in there. I think this kind of conversation is actually uh, you know, a really great example of, I think, the broader conversations we should be having um, in this space. But um, one interesting, like this is a, the question of how to define high-risk AI, how to frame it, is something we grappled a lot with when uh, writing the Cracking the Black Box open report. And um, an interesting a sort of discussion I came across was one that was happening in the EU where uh, many stakeholders are starting to define high-risk AI as a system that poses threats or harms to fundamental rights. And I think that ties in a little bit of what Christine was talking about and a little bit of what Catherine was talking about. So, you know, some examples that were circulated were algorithms that determine creditworthiness, algorithms that are determining whether an individual is sentenced uh, to jail, um, but then also algorithms that, as Catherine was mentioning, not just deter making determinations, but that could pose an, uh, an issue down the line. So algorithms that are used in police technology, and uh, depending who's uh, sort of interacting with that technology, is then sort of uh, producing a harmful outcome. Um, just to sort of like tie together some of the threads, I think that. Um, you know, it's a really complex question of like how to define something that will so critically, you know, will have such a critical impact on how we move forward in this space. Um, and I think an overly broad definition will, you know, likely uh, require companies and governments to conduct evaluations of systems that perhaps are not of significant concern and then use valuable resources that you know, could have been used elsewhere. But uh, to Catherine's point, you know, you can't always clearly define um, and understand the risk right off the bat. Sometimes, you know, systems change, the situations change, the context change. Um, but an overly narrow de definition could also exclude systems that do make critical and high risk decisions or that could in the future. Um, and so I think that we definitely need to continue these conversations, but I would emphasize that the longer we put off these conversations, and it's not to say that this conversation is easy at all and can be resolved, you know, over drinks one night, but um, the longer we put this off, I think the longer entities that are perhaps using systems that we find concerning, they are able to define the term on their own, and they essentially can set the terms 
write the questions and grade their own homework. And so I think it's really critical for promoting accountability around these systems that we start to move forward and uh, you know, put forth a couple more concrete proposals, uh, try to test them out perhaps, uh, because right now it's really a grading your own homework situation. Thank you all. Um, yes, it is. I think it's really a challenge, but that this is a great sort of conversation, as Sandy said, um, and sort of a, an example of the bigger conversation that everyone's having that we need to have um, and difficult to come to consensus um, on this. But um, first of all, I'd like to give the audience a reminder to please um, use Slido to submit your questions. Uh, Slido, again, is the box located on the right of the video. Um, and if you have any issues with that at all, you can contact us at events at newamerica.org. You can send your questions there. Um, and so we will be looking for those. Um, but in the meantime, we certainly have more things we can discuss. Um, so again, I'm gonna pose another question to, for everyone to weigh in on here. Um, so I think as we've been talking about throughout and as I sort of started with, we tend to talk about many of these mechanisms for promoting um, fairness, accountability, and transparency in a siloed fashion. We talk about um, you know, ML documentation practices very separately from how we talk about audits and th they're often not part of the same uh, conversation. And um, then we talk about transparency reports entirely separately, I'm wondering how we can connect those conversations and what are the challenges? We'll start there and then I have a sort of follow up. I don't mind jumping in. Did somebody else, Kevin, you want to go? Yeah, I, I just had a very short response, which is that I was motivated. Uh, in particular, I was really piqued by the, the cracking the open the black box does a real service, I think, by um, surveying and putting them all together in a document. And as I mentioned in my longer remarks, I won't repeat them here, I was really struck by how a kind of administrative law accountability framework, similar to one that I designed with respect to federalism accountability, could really work here. And what it did is it gave me food for thought with respect to you know, bringing in things like the, particularly the impact assessment, because that's very analogous to the federalism impact one, but um, Christine's made me think a little bit too about sort of the documentation requirements. And we had occasion, I'll let her speak uh, for herself, but we had occasion, she talked, told me a little bit offline uh, the other day about some discussions with GSA about how they might incorporate some of those things with respect to their procurement process. So, um, so to me, um, there are some very um, easy ways, right? So if we bring in some of these tools into an administrative law you know, um, framework and publish it, et cetera, to get these people maybe talking together about it. So the report does a, does a service you know, by doing that, bringing it together in one place. And I guess the answer is each of us from our own individual vantage point to be challenged to think about what are ways in our own work that we can um, try to show, not tell, the need to do this. That's awesome. Uh, show, not tell, I like that. Um, yeah, ab absolutely, Catherine. We're talking with some folks over in GSA because you know they create those templates that government agencies use in order to procure What's that percentage? Was it from your study? Was it the 33%? Yeah, 33%. To procure that 33% of machine learning AI uh, asset, we're talking about, well, what language needs to go in that contract? What do you need to require upon delivery? So that's going to be a really interesting and exciting possibility for actioning transparency. But to the question um, originally uh, posed by Lauren about how do we connect these conversations, I'm going to quote Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy for breakfast, or maybe it's lunch, for at least one meal of the day, culture eats strategy. And I feel like it's not about having these amazing tools that are super important, or even this strategy or methodology or approach uh, for documentation, which is really important. It's about a shift, a paradigm shift in the culture of the way we de develop and deploy 
uh, these machine learning systems. You know, we all know from experience the way technology becomes pervasive. It changes the way we do life, the way we, like imagine going around without your phone for a month, like, oh, how do we do that, right? It just, so it just shifts the way we engage with the world. So just thinking of how as an organization, we can focus on a culture shift where documentation, whatever the cost, if you've got to have a whole new department of generalists that cross model, cross department, cross algorithmic function are in charge of doing this life cycle documentation and can then inform at an enterprise level what you're seeing, what's, what records are being kept. That's an amazing thing to do, but it takes lots of time. It's hard, culture shift, especially I believe in the federal government is difficult, especially in a very hierarchical space, like maybe the Department of Defense or uh, some military uh, um, groups. So it's just a tough thing to do, but it's at the, at the heart of how we make this uh, change and how we operationalize responsible AI and, and transparency. Yeah, and I would just build on that. I think part of that culture shift um, that we need more broadly in the space also um, needs to uh, include trust and transparency. I, I see a lot of uh, times when stakeholders from different sides of the space want to talk about, you know, a certain type of algorithmic system, for example, but that trust doesn't exist between the relevant parties. And as a result, there's not any meaningful communication or transparency. You know, what we mostly get uh, from each different side are talking points like this is what we think is happening and then like this is what's actually happening. And I think if we're really trying to push forward meaningful multi-stakeholder dialogues that are actually trying to promote accountability, you know, in all aspects of the space, then we need to uh, sort of build trusting relationships with companies, with government agencies and vice versa uh, to sort of engender this notion that we're working towards the same goal. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you all. Um, so I think, again, in, it, building on that and like sort of working to bring together all these conversations, um, we've obviously talked about a whole, just within this past hour, we've talked about a whole different, a whole constellation of different methods. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, if there's any uh, sort of gold standard mechanism that you all would be willing to put forth like, or, or sort of put your finger on the scale for um, that should be used sort of across context. Again, when we're, when we're at least talking about high risk algorithms, um, is there one uh, method of promoting fairness, accountability and transparency that sort of reigns supreme? Uh, do we need audits or external audits in every circumstance or um, in most circumstances or anything like that. I'm wondering, again, we've talked about, and there's probably a need for a combination of different mechanisms, and it is very context specific. Um, I think, especially as Christine was saying. Um, but I'm wondering if, if you all would put forth the idea that there's one that sort of needs to be there all the time. I'm happy to jump in there. <laughs> Maybe just to be a little contrary, uh, no. Uh, I think like you mentioned, there are, um, and as we've discussed during this panel, like there are benefits and disadvantages to each approach. And one of the things that we, uh, my co op and I really tried to drive in through the report are that, you know, many of these approaches can supplement one another if we did bring them together into a holistic approach for promoting FAT. Um, that's not to say that you know one approach could not be championed, but I think that um, especially just as we've seen through this conversation, like procurement has so many advantages that maybe machine learning documentation doesn't even touch on, that maybe audits don't even touch on and vice versa. Um, and they also have different limitations that they perhaps could fill in. So I think that there are best practices we can learn from each sort of side of the conversation, but I'm not sure that I would uh, say that one of them necessarily reigns supreme. So I'll go out on a limb and say, it's probably um, apparent from my prior comments that within the governmental context, 
I'm most drawn to the idea of um, requiring a kind of um, algorithmic impact assessment and how that could fit into an administrative law mechanism, particularly with respect to thinking about the importation of AI into the rulemaking context. So again, that doesn't, I'm I'm cabin, I'm going, I'm going bold by choosing and defending one, but I'm narrowing kind of the context. But what I like about that again, and the thought that I've done today about the analogies with federalism is it will force kind of in real time and with differing views backed hopefully by some empirical data and some study and learning, um, some of these definitional controversies that I agree with Spondi, we don't want to let it, we don't want to let those definitional sort of controversies um, paralyze us. So again, people can vehemently disagree with whether an agency, for example, should set a standard and should preempt all state tort law, but I think we all could agree that they can't do that and say there are no federalism impacts. And that was happening, and then we had an administrative law framework that, is, that assessed that. So there's some low-hanging fruit that we want to make sure we don't miss. So we shouldn't allow for governmental uses in the rulemaking context to go forward without such an assessment. And then we have tools that are already existing within that process to scrutinize. Now we'll get into all sorts of debates about when it comes to like courts review, should it be hard look? What should judges demand or a soft touch? Cause it's technological areas. It's not gonna solve those problems and we have to continue to debate them. But I think that one to me looks like a very powerful tool that we can, what I like also about it is we can kind of put it into existing administrative law and judicial review frameworks for the government uses, at least in rulemaking. I'll second that. I, I'll go for impact assessment. Uh, you know, that's super important, thinking about the risks, how you might mitigate risks that, that show up, and being bold in the way we distinguish between issues and risks, um, issues being things they've already happened, they've already occurred, it's already real, it's already live, it's already impacting um uh people or systems so i, I think that's it but it, yeah it's tough it's tough to name just one thing right because uh they're so interrelated i think about um my time as a consultant and uh as an enterprise architect and the work we had to do to show uh agencies like omb why we deserved this funding and we'd have to show all these architectural diagrams and how one system impacts another and we'd have to show all these requirements and traceability and how one affects another. And then uh, that on top of any type of uh, budget information and the costs and how the costs could double or triple or, you know, what if COVID happens, you know? So this, there's so many things that affect so many other things, but I think impact assessment is a nice, if we had to require one thing, um, especially across federal agencies, that, that would be a nice thing to consider, just asking those questions up front. Thanks, yeah, I know it's a tough question, especially since, again, as many of you have said, it's often very context specific, what mechanism we need, and also many of them should be probably working together. Um, but, but thanks for, um, Thanks for humoring me a little there. Um, and so again, sort of building on that, uh, and Spandy, you mentioned that there may not be one tool for every uh, circumstance, but that there are best practices for promoting FAT um, around high-risk AI. Um, I'm wondering, are there best practices that you've seen internet platforms, and sorry, this question's for everyone. Are there, are there, be are there best practices that you've seen internet platforms use um, that you think could maybe be brought over into the government context um, or vice versa? Are there some you know, practices that the government's using that haven't really been explored by a lot of private entities or internet platforms? Um, yeah, anyone wanna? I'll give a real quick example. Uh, there's a site, it's, it's a, it's called designethically.com. They have a sort of a monitoring checklist. And so I would say this really helpful thing is the idea of, even though you have successfully developed and even successfully deployed, that it doesn't end there. Just that whole concept of watching, 
being aware, making note, monitoring, checking in with users, you know, so just this idea of uh, kind of like kids, you know, like it doesn't matter how old they are at any point they could come and ask you for money, right? You're going to always have this model to babysit and to monitor and to watch. And in that active monitoring, you know, there's this opportunity for improvement throughout the life of that model and any other model uh, that is built based on uh, the, the, the tenets of that model. I can jump in. Um, so I, I, at OTI, we do a lot of work around platform transparency efforts. Um, and we definitely you know, encourage platforms to always be more transparent about their operations and policies. I think over the last few years, um, I've noticed that some platforms have started releasing more public information explaining how their algorithmic systems work um, in a sort of more digestible way so that the average user or perhaps the a researcher can understand the structure of these systems. Um, as someone who spends most of their time reading about this, that's been really helpful. Um, and I, I think the ACUS report was really interesting because that was the first sort of like breakdown of a comparable sort of breakdown uh, that I saw. And so, uh, of course, there are different sensitivities when it comes to the government um, and how much you can share. But I, I do think sort of that um, transparency to raise awareness um, and generate common understanding in an explainable fashion around when systems are being deployed, how they're being deployed, what impact they can have, that that's a I think that's like a first step best practice that I think should be applied holistically. And I'll, I'll just add, I mean, it was alluded to in your um, report, and I guess I hold out, uh, it's always good uh, when there are bodies that are ongoing, but they haven't received, they haven't reached the end of their efforts. One can be quite hopeful, but the effort by NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, right, they were, um, they were energized by certain executive orders, but as your report uh, talks about, they really um, have a desire to collaborate with both private sector and academia um, with respect to establishing sort of standards in this area. I guess I'm curious if we're, if we're allowed to ask questions of our panelists, right? So should I should I dampen my enthusiasm for NIST? I mean, this is a this is a true question. I don't know whether either of you has had much opportunity to collaborate, work with them, but it seems like as an entity, particularly with respect to having the technological expertise, and then if they're open to an infusion of legal policy input, et cetera, along the development of these standards, it seems like that could be a very fruitful model. So should I continue to be so enthusiastic and hopeful? Yes. <laughs> we answered the um, request for information and just talked about how you know, some practical approaches to developing this template, this guide, this framework, and then also the use and the audiences that might benefit from it. So I say yes, just because the conversation has started, right? And they're a very pivotal or, uh, organization within the federal government. So you get points for, points for starting the conversation. So yes. <laughs> Yeah, it would plus one though. We also submitted comments as part of NIST's recent consultation on AI bias. Um, and I, I believe a number of other civil society organizations did as well. So it definitely sees, seems like that infusion is happening. And yeah, like Christine said, like we're pretty early on in this conversation. So I would hope that it's not too late that we've lost hope. Um, and I, I think that there can definitely be some meaningful work that NIST can do. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, so we've got kind of a kind of a tough audience question that just came in. Um, I'll go ahead and throw it to you all. <laughs> um, so does the do you think the increasing use of AI in government and business seriously threaten our democracy? I mean, if Twitter can almost take us down, <laughs> anything's possible, right? So that's, you know, when I think about 
a question like that, I think about, uh, do we want to forfeit um, the evolution of technology or do we want to forfeit all the benefit that we could possibly get from some breakthrough just because of the risk, the very real risks of that technology or that breakthrough being used for harm? And the answer is no, no, we've just got to be thinking about risk. We've got to be thinking about mitigation. We've got to be thinking about all scenarios, not just the good ones, not just the ones we put forward to get the budget we wanted, but the ones that are bad and that could turn it on its side. And so, so no, I mean, it's possible, but that shouldn't be a, a showstopper for us. Catherine will, will agree with me. We'll put we'll put stuff in place to make it possible to still move forward. Yes, I, you've you've intuited. I do agree. I think it's very worthwhile, like you say, to think about. I often think about in the terms of the promise and the peril of the use of these technologies, and it's definitely worthwhile to um, try to come at this in a kind of level-headed way. I also would second the idea. As with all prior technological developments, I think we need to take a kind of risk management approach, right? People, I teach a variety of different things in the law school, and sometimes people come in with this idea that, to go back to the FDA again, that their job should be to reduce the uh, risk of medical devices and drugs to zero. And we all know that would mean no life-saving medical devices or drugs. So that's just not feasible. We are going to have to think about, we cannot hold sort of algorithmic accountability to some standard like that. At the same time, it challenges us because some people come up with metrics that technologies, as long as they're better than human biases, errors. Again, that was alluded to, I think, Christine, you mentioned in your, um, the, um, I don't want to call them the category, the catalog of horrors or the, or the catalog of harmed instances, right? You have an autonomous vehicle incident, right? So, well, if we compared that to automobile accidents, right, something like 98 to 99% caused by human error, we would start to be very enthusiastic about autonomous vehicles. Now, that doesn't mean, in my opinion, that we throw up our hands and not worry about these kinds of issues, but it's really, really difficult to figure out in a level-headed risk management kind of way how we should uh, go forward. But absolutely, it shouldn't, we shouldn't um, stymie the development because the promise side um, is real. And so the way I like to think about it is it's like all kinds of risky technologies. We need to think hard about, uh, about oversight um, and about um, sometimes these things are quantifiable and sometimes they're values driven and we have to bring all of that into the conversation so it won't be easy. I would plus one that I would also say that a lot of the times with some of the technologies we grow to be concerned about the harms that they generate are we're in the moment unforeseeable and they, they act in ways we didn't predict but sometimes these technologies are also exacerbating pre-existing harms pre-existing inequities and so when we think about how uh, these tools can interface with uh, you know our democratic structures I think we need to you know, do have a little foresight in the ways they could mess things up, but also recognize that our societies aren't perfect either. So we need to be thinking about how can we improve those societal structures as well to ensure the democratic principles and so on uh, remain strong and resilient as we introduce new technology. And, and Catherine, I'm going to tell our team that we should change the name of the incidents database to the catalog of horrors. I think that's a much better, a much better branding. <laughs> I do like that. <laughs> um, so that was a sort of broader question. We zoomed out a bit there with an audience question, but to sort of <clears throat> zoom back into some specifics. Um, <clears throat> sorry, um, just a second. So, um, Catherine, in the ACUS report, um, you all outlined some sort of key next steps and recommendations. I was wondering if you could let it, uh, give us a bit of an overview of what you all recommended and sort of what needs, what needs to happen next for the government. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, a big piece that um, that I don't want to get too sidetracked, but that I haven't uh, uh, hit on as much in my remarks is really the building of the internal capacity. Um, and there are some challenges there, right? There are both um, financial recruitment challenges that the government faces, um, uh, but the idea, again, to return to our empirical finding that of the 142 major uh, agencies that we were serving, nearly half were deploying some form of machine learning AI, and of the um, use cases, nearly half, a little over half, were being built in-house, um, suggests that it's um, an interesting piece of this. And I think the building of the internal capacity is only going to help with the kind of efforts that Christine and I were talking a little bit back and forth about, about sort of the idea that those within government are gonna be able to interface with outside groups concerned about these kinds of issues, getting technologists and lawyers into the same room and the like. But realistically or practically speaking, I think, um, we encountered several examples. Again, the FDA comes to mind because they were really out on the vanguard of this, of kind of trying to build these non-commercial, sometimes commercial, but often non-commercial collaborations with academia in particular, um, with nonprofits. The FDA offers, you know, various types of, um, you know, research fellowship type positions to get people who are doing cutting edge work in other sectors, you know, in academia and in, in other, even in the private sector, sometimes internally coming to the agency. And I think we need to be um, open to those kinds of things. My own view is while the procurement piece is important for all the reasons that we've talked about that by and large, I think that the, that agencies given the sophistication and the nuanced contextual work that they're doing are going to have to develop the internal capacity. And I think that that's going to um, be a positive development. So thinking about ways to um, encourage that, I think is a, is, a key, uh, is a key theme there. Thanks for that. Um, and I think this next question is related, so I'll, I'll add it on here, but I think that, that means that it likely was coming back to you, Catherine. Um, but we just had an audience question. Could you address the role of lawsuits in cases in which government entities deployed flawed AI? Um, so that's an interesting one, and one that we maybe haven't spent as much time talking or thinking about. Um, will the concern about being sued lead to more careful deployment, you think? So it's interesting. Um, one of the things outside of the AI context, as I said, I alluded to earlier, kind of administrative law accountability framework, and I mentioned judicial review. Just to be clear there, I was talking about judicial review when people challenge, you know, rules. So let's take, for example, an agency that decides to issue a rule about doing kind of a retrospective review of its prior regulations and deploys an AI technology that is helping it to map out both what might be um, kind of overly burdensome rules or things that they might wanna revise and the like. And they come up with this rule um, and let's imagine someone challenges the rule. That's what I was talking about when I was talking about judicial review. And I have written about before, and I do believe, right? Uh, academics differ about whether or not this threat of judicial review will induce agencies to do things differently. And my own view, it's hard to gather empirics on that. There are lots of strong anecdotal evidence, but my own view is that by and large, yes, it does incentivize agencies, for example, to think about things like federalism impacts or here, think about, algorithmic uh, impact assessments to do the job, the best job they can, kind of defining those terms, thinking about the impacts, putting it out there because there will be this scrutiny down the road. Um, now the question raises a different angle, which is you know, actually suing government. Now it's something, um, there, are other, there are other groups and organizations that have focused on that piece and, um, and I haven't in my own work in this area. I'm not averse. Again, there's no, there's not a kind of like inherent bias other than the fact that I was very interested and continue to be interested to explore kind of existing ways within 
agencies that they're deploying these techniques and there are um you know entities that come at this with a much more adverse adversarial and advocacy perspective that's either hostile or supporting the agency and given the work that i'm doing i haven't engaged you know in the former type but as a general matter and as a scholar who teaches tort law and thinks very much about kind of the deterrent effect of lawsuits I do believe that whether we're thinking about government or really increasingly thinking about private entities deploying these kinds of technologies, I do think they're thinking about potential liability and that that does give them incentives. For example, if they're autonomous vehicle manufacturers, they're going to get added incentives, you know, towards um, safety. Um, it would be an interesting piece of this whole puzzle, and I'm sure maybe Spandy or or even Christine, you know of, you know, um, organizations that are, um, you know, cataloging. I, I, I've read about these I, as a, I'm a consumer of sort of the secondary literature. Just my own research hasn't focused on the angle of suing government over use of these technologies. Yeah, I can't say I'm a consumer of that content either. Uh, maybe I should be, but um, just to something you mentioned about incentives, um, there is uh, sort of like a discussion around in the AI accountability space of whether uh, developers of AI should be given sort of like subsidies or some sort of benefit to uh, sort of develop uh, more robust tools that match up with FAT expectations. And I think, uh, and we talk about this in the report in a, a little bit, but I think, you know, that that kind of begs the question of, do we think accountability is, that kind of accountability is something that needs to be incentivized in that way? Or do we think that that's something that should just be an expectation from the ground up um, and that, you know, developers should be doing Anyways, um. yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I think it comes, in my mind, it comes back to a little bit of um, an earlier question, Lauren, you asked me about sort of the positive and negatives of the procurement from the private sector versus building in-house. So I do think that a benefit within government, at least of the building in-house is there's, there's a sort of, um, they're already primed to be thinking about these kinds of accountability mechanisms given the administrative law framework that surrounds all of this. Um, in the private sector, again, maybe that would become, as you said, just sort of like a baseline norm so long as they're brought in at the earlier stages. I mean, again, my worry is sort of a, a buying the, the sort of um, the example of horror to come back Christine that I have is sort of a, a governmental entity um, that's using this for a determinative uh, use that might deny uh, someone a benefit taking kind of an off the shelf tool that's already developed that for some other purpose that they know nothing about, you know, and deploying it. So that's the kind of, that's the example of horror. It's not to say that earlier on, there couldn't be sort of collaborations. I personally think that it takes having some people within the agency to have the technological sophistication um, to sit in the same room, as I said, the, in, in some ways, I'll just come back to, I mean, I'm a law professor, so maybe this isn't going to surprise anyone, but I was actually really blown away when I did this piloting with the Stanford NYU students. We did a cross-national um, Zoom, and this was, you know, pre-pandemic requiring this, so everyone's much more facile even for with the use of these technologies. But we had, you know, PhD computer scientists, law students, professors, all of us trying to talk together about the legal and the technological issues. And it was very, and just reading the kind of same documents and asking the kinds of questions. Now we had a selection effect. We had law students who were interested in the technological side and tech people who are interested in the legal policy realm. But I guess for me, that's a little bit of a microcosm of a model for the future and a way in which we can have this, um, you know, cross fertilization, I think each of us has been talking about. Well, thanks for all of that, everyone. And yeah, Christine, I was, or I'm sorry, Catherine, I was going to add on 
the exact um, comment that you mentioned, but as a follow-up, uh, yeah, I think that it's not just the government who should be concerned about the, the possibility of lawsuits um, if they're deploying these, uh, if they're deploying high-risk algorithms within a, you know, a, in a non-transparent, unaccountable sort of manner um, that, that create harm. Um, but anyway, I think that that was actually our last audience question. And so I think we may wrap up a few minutes early, um, unless anyone wants to offer any sort of final thoughts on this very wide ranging conversation. Okay, well, um, just wanted to give you all one last chance to, to add in anything we, that you didn't have the chance to say, but, um, but yes, I'd just like to first thank our panelists. Um, we really appreciate, appreciated all your insights today. And I know I learned a lot. I'm sure our audience feels the same. So thank you all. Um, audience, thank you all for joining us as always uh, and, and for the uh, great questions. Um, and thank you to our New America events team for helping facilitate and put this on. Um, this was a great conversation and I'm sure these themes and discussions will be ongoing. So um, nice, nice to hear from you all in chat today. Thank you.